Hello, thank you for joining us and welcome to this webinar event. You are viewing one of many such webinar-based professional development events that is brought to you by Texas Instruments Australia as part of our ongoing support for teachers in the classroom. Today's topic is exam preparation for the International Baccalaureate Mathematical Studies SL course. And your presenters are Bajina Graham and Joanna Kiprianu. My name is Brian Lannan. I'm your host for the event. But let me tell you more about Bajina. Bajina is uh, one of our T cubed national instructors, currently teaching at Wesley College in Melbourne. And when we do these webinars, we often assign Bajina the, the tough topics because she's an absolute whiz at calculus, VCE specialist maths, mathematical studies, all the IB courses. Good evening, Bojina. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Brian. And uh, lovely to have you presenting with us once again. Our viewers will also be keen to note, as they see there, that you are a, uh, an examiner for the uh, IB. Um, so let's take note of what she has to say. And also very passionate about the use of um, the use of technology in the classroom to help understanding, discovering learning, learning through explorations, um, and also for helping sharing her knowledge with fellow teachers. Our other presenter this evening comes to us from uh, Monte St. Angelo Mercy College in Sydney, Joanna Kiprianu. Good evening, Joanna. Good evening, Brian. How are you? I'm going very well, thank you. Lovely once again to have you on the program. And you can see here that uh, Joanna has taught all levels of the New South Wales HSC, as well as the IB courses. She's the go-to person in her school for both staff and students for uh, the use of um, computing technologies, or, and ha particularly handheld um, technologies, uh, to the point that she's thought, well, let's put this all together in an iBook, which is now selling pretty much across the world. Well done with that, Joanna. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, you see here a dedicated educator sharing, sharing her um, knowledge with students and colleagues and also decorated in awards here. Congratulations, that's all very good. And <laughs> so we're all very pleased to be hearing from you. I'll hand it over to you, Joanna. Thank you, Brian. Okay, um, so tonight I'm first going through some calculus questions, um, very similar to exam style questions that I've found in um, studies exams in paper two, oh, in paper one. So, and so um, here's our first question. It says, consider this function f x. Um, the gradient of the curve at point A is 35. Find the x coordinate of point A. Well, I've already found the derivative for you. So f dash x is 3 plus 4 over x cubed to help us along. Now, um, the first, we can do this in a couple of different ways. The first way is to graph the function and then find the point where the derivative is 35. So we can open a calculator document. Oh, sorry. A, actually, we'll open a graphing document first. And now we're going to graph our function, the original function. So 3 times x minus, I'll get a fraction in there, 2 over x squared. Okay, so that's our function. Let's just enter and graph it. Okay, so I want to know when the, gra when the gradient is 35. So first, I'm going to press menu, then analyze graph, and pick dy dx. And then I'm just going to put it here. Now, at the moment, that gradient is 16.5, and that's not what I want. I want 35, so I'm going to drag it down. And oh, look at that. We get 35. Now, if for some reason you don't quite get exactly 35, you can always um, zoom in around your point to get exactly 35. So now that I've gotten 35, which is exactly what I want, the gradient that I want, I still need to find the coordinates of the point. So 
So I present menu, geometry, points and lines, and then point on. And I click on that, and here's my actual point. It's 0 0.5, negative 6.5. Now all we wanted was the x coordinate, so our answer is x is 0 0.5. What's nice about this method is it's a little bit more, um, it shows the student, the study student, what's actually happening. It's literally showing a point with gradient 35 and x coordinate of 0 0.5 as opposed to solving an equation or something like that. So it's for maybe students that, you know, it's harder to visualize, they can really see it all happening here. Another way you could do it is by solving the equation for the derivative equal to 35 and then solving it for x. And um, so we can use numerical solve for that. So if we go back to our calculator documents, menu, algebra, numerical solve. Okay, so we want, if I just have a look at the calculator, um, cal our derivative function, 3 plus 4 over x cubed, so 3 plus Fraction 4 over x cubed, and we want that to equal 35. Okay, now we need to tell what variable to solve it for, so we'll put comma and then x and press enter. And there we go, we get the same x coordinate of 0 0.5. So there's two ways to solve the same question in an exam. Both are pretty easy on the calculator, just depending on what the student's more comfortable with. Okay, so here's the next question. Consider the function gx equals x cubed plus kx squared minus 15x plus 5. Now, I've already given you the derivative function just because that's not so much what we're here for. It's we, already, we want to know that, and now we want to do the calculator stuff. Okay, so. The tangent to the graph of y equals gx at x equals 2 is parallel to the line 21x plus 7. Find the value of k. Okay, so what we can do sorry, is graph, sorry, we can basically just solve for when the derivative equals 21 because we want it parallel to this line, therefore we want the gradient to be 21. But that's when x equals 2. So if we substitute x equals 2 into there, then solve it for 21. Now, because uh, study students sometimes, in my experience, can be a little bit um, weaker on their uh, algebraic skills, solving equations, we can make this really simple by literally just subbing in 2 not doing too much algebra and just making it equal to 21. So if we open a calculator document, and again, we're going to do a numerical solve. Okay, so let's sub in 2 in there. Well, here we get 2 squared is 4, 4 threes are 12, plus 4k minus 15. So we get 12 plus 4k minus 15, and we want that to equal 21. And this time, I want to solve it for k. So I have to type in k. Press enter, and I get 6. So k is actually 6. OK. B. Find the equation of the tangent to the graph of y equals gx at equals, equals 2. Give your answer in the form a, mx plus c. Okay. So now, a good thing would be to graph the function. So let's open a graphing document. And let's graph the curve, which was x cubed. Get out of the power. Uh, plus 6x squared. Minus 15x plus 5. 
Okay. Beautiful. Now, the best thing to do first is to get a point on the curve and get it where you want it, then do the tangent at that point. So, the first thing I do is menu, geometry, points and lines, point on. Now, I click on somewhere on the curve, maybe I think x equals 2 is around here, let's say. Now, I didn't get it quite right. There's my point. I didn't get it quite right. It's about 1.8, but that's okay. What I can do is double click on the 1.8. Oops, sorry. So I escape on the, uh, now, something you notice, this is like on here, means I'm still trying to do point on, and it won't let me do much else. So if I press escape, that goes away, which means I can now do something else. So I'm gonna click on the double 1.8, here we go. Now that means I can edit it. So I'm gonna delete 1.8 and click on two, press enter. All right, now what's happened? Obviously two is somewhere up here and we can't see it. So let's pull this down so we can see it. There's our point that we wanted. Move that. Okay, so there's my point, two seven. Now I want a tangent at specifically that point. So menu, analyze graph, oh sorry. Geometry, <laughs> points and lines, and tangents. And now I click on the specific point that I want, and there it is, my um, equation to my tangent, I'm uh, sorry, the equation of the tangent at that point is y equals 21x minus 35. Very good. Yes. Yeah, I love the way the equation okay. pops up with that, yeah. I know, I love that, it's so good. And um, I'm sure students love it too, it makes life easier for them. <laughs> and okay, so now we're gonna go back to the question. And as we can see, the 21x plus 35, oh, let's check, yep, yeah, 21x minus 35, that is exactly in the form that we wanted it, so that's done. Now, use your derivative and the value of k to find the x coordinate of the stationary points of the graph y equals gx. Now, that sounds like we can just go here, oh, there's a minimum point, let's do upper bound, lower bound, and find the x coordinate of that minimum point. But then we wouldn't be following their instructions. We need to actually use the derivative and the value of k. In other words, we have to do something with the derivative, or solve it for when the derivative equals zero. So we can't cheat and use our graph, unfortunately. So basically, as I'm, if someone's marking it, they would want to see that they're using their derivative. So what they should be doing, students should be doing on their question paper, is writing down what the derivative is, including the value of k. So on their question paper, they should be writing 3x squared plus 12x, because k is 6, minus 15, and for stationary points, we want that to equal zero and then we can just solve that equation using our GDC. But if a mark can see that, they know that they're doing the right thing and using uh, the derivative and the value of k. So we want to solve when that derivative equals zero. So we can go to our calculator document and solve, oh sorry, sorry. we've actually then got a quadratic so rather than n solve, we can use polynomial tools. Find the roots of a polynomial. The degree is two, the roots are real. <laughs> In studies, they're definitely real. So it was three x squared plus, now it's 12 x because again, it was two k x and k we found is six. So it's 12 x minus 15, so we want negative 15 negative 15 and press OK. There we go. And so it's done it all for us, which is lovely. Enter, and there they are there. So basically the X coordinates of the stationary points are negative five and one. Now in case, a student wants to use nsolve, they forget about polyroots and they want to use nsolve. We can do that. We can go menu, algebra, nsolve. 
So then we can grab this here, so it's 3x squared plus 12x minus 15. But now we have to put the equals part. So in n we have to do that. So we have to put equals 0, comma, I want to solve it for x. And then enter. Now look at that, I'm only getting one because n solve only ever gives you one solution. So I want another solution either smaller than one or bigger than one. So what I can do there is press up, grab this again, press enter. But now I'm going to go control equals and press this line. So what I'm now doing, I'm going to give a bound to x. And so you have to give me the, the GDC has to give me a solution where x is less than 1. And there it is there, negative 5. If, say, you didn't get anything there or it was 1 again, then you could always check when x was bigger than 1 and see if there's 1 up there. So there's a couple ways you can do that. Mm, that's a clever okay. thing to note, isn't it? Yeah. Because yeah, the, yeah. the x variable will be held uh, as it was last, as it was last, which in those calculations would have been one, which is why mm. I found that wreck first. Um, but mm. as a, as a um, yeah, a, as a drill, it's probably a good idea to take that first root and then make that set that up on the inequality to look yeah, for any exactly. other root. Good, yeah, good exactly. procedure. I like. It. Yeah, what I find with NSOLVE is it generally likes to um, choose the positive one first, the smallest positive. Now, that's what it'll give you first, and then you have to look for some others. That's, that's uh -huh. what my experience, but maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> um, okay, so the next is find the Y coordinate of the local minimum. Okay, so we can do that a couple of different ways. We could sub both of these x coordinates into the original equation and then see which y, um, y value is smaller and that's the minimum. Or the easiest thing would be to use the graph, so we might just do that. Obviously our minimum is somewhere down here. I'm just going to drag it so we can see it a little bit better. So we can go to menu, analyze graph, minimum. Okay, we have to pick a lower bound and an upper bound and there it is there. The uh, y coordinate of the local minimum is negative 3. Okay, so for our last calculus question, uh, consider the function if f dash x is that, let t be the tangent to the graph at the function fx of point 2, negative 12. Find the gradient at t. Okay, so we just want to substitute 2 into there, that's pretty easy. So they can do that quite, because I'm running out of time, I'm going to keep moving. They can do that quite easily by just typing in the calculator, 3 times 2 cubed minus 3 times 2 squared minus 18 times 2. Now, the line now passes through the point, 2 negative 12, and it's perpendicular to T. Find the gradient of L. So if they're, um, okay, so if they're not feeling comfortable with that, what they could always do is just to find, once they've got the gradient of t, which I can tell you in a second, it's actually negative 24. Now, if they're not comfortable with working out what the gradient is um, using numerical methods, they can always type into their calculator negative 1, uh, negative 1, sorry divided by their answer, oh sorry, uh, sorry, negative 24. Oops, apologies. So negative 1 divided by negative 24. There we go. So it's actually just one on 24. And that's it. Okay, so now we'll do a bit of finance. Um, one buys a bicycle on his sale and he gets a 30% discount off the original price. Calculate the original price of the bicycle. Now they can just do um, if 70% equals 560, find 100% unitary method. But if a student isn't really um, comfortable with that, they can actually use their finance solver. So if we open the calculator document, press menu, finance, 
finance SOLVA, we can treat it kind of like a depreciation question. So, apologize, I'll just find it. Okay, so basically if we think about it as one time period, and the depreciation is going down by 30%. So we think of the rate um, is negative 30, and then the future value becomes 560. What was the original value? Well, we press, click into the PV and press enter. And there it is there. Now, you should know that the present value is always pretty much negative. It's like, because we're giving money away into the bank. So. Um, the original value for the bike was 800. Okay, so now I'll press escape to get out of that. Now, to buy the bicycle, one takes a loan of 560 USD for six months at a nominal annual interest rate of 75% compounded monthly. Calculate the difference between the original price of the bicycle and the total amount one will pay. So you want the future value of this loan. So if we go back to our calculator document, menu, finance, finance solver. Okay, so it's for six months, so I'm gonna put in six. But for the interest rate, it was 75% annually, and interest is always annual. And then the present value was 560. And I wanna find how much the loan ends up being, so I press enter. Oh, sorry, I've done something wrong there, just a second. What have I done wrong? I've forgotten that it's compounded monthly, so I need to put 12 in here, 12 in there, which automatically happens. Then I click in here and press enter, that's much nicer. The future value is $805.68. Now why is that negative? Because I forgot to put a negative here, which is absolutely fine actually. It really doesn't matter as long as they know that um, that's okay. So the answer is the... different directions, yeah. Yeah, um, so yeah. basically he ends up paying $805.68. So the difference between the original value, which was $800, is $5.68. All right, I'm going to try and race through one more and then we'll see how we go. Arthur invests X euros in an account that pays a nominal annual interest rate of 3.6 per annum percent, uh, compounded monthly. After 18 years, he will have that much in the account by the bit of X. Essentially, we're finding the present value. So I'm going to open a calculator document menu. Oops, sorry. It's not a calculator document. Okay, let's open a calculator document properly. Okay, menu. Finance, finance silver. Okay, so now here's the thing. It's 18 years, but it's monthly. So what I can do is just do 18 times 12, and I'll let them take care of it. The interest rate, and which they have, that's in 216, the interest rate is 3.5%. Okay, the future value, what he wants it to become is 35,300. And the PPY, that's 12, which automatically makes the CPY 12, because it's monthly. So then I click in present value, press enter, and... The present value to invest. Yep. Yep. The present value to in ah, he's not, okay. So I accidentally, that should be 3.6, apologize. Ah. Let's try that again. <laughs> okay, so the, what he needs to invest today is $18,483.03, and, and something students should always know with money, they're uh, rounding to two decimal places. And do we have time for the last one? Let's see. Jacob invested 9,000 euros for N years. The investment has a nominal annual interest rate of 3.2%, compounded quarterly this time. After N years, the investment will be worth 35,300 euros. Find the value of N. Okay, so again, we're going to open our finance. Solver, finance, solver. Okay, now this time. Yeah, okay, so this time we want the interest rate is now 3.2. The present value that is investing is investing is negative 9,000. 
okay? He wants it again to become the future value of 35,300, but this time we're quarterly, so I need these to be full. Yep, okay, now what I want is N, so I click in there, press enter. So it's 171.5, but what is it? It's actually quarters, that's how many quarters we have. N is the number of years that we actually want to find. So what I need to do is do 171.5 and divide it by four. And there we go. So now it's 42.875, but if I want to get the right enough money, I have to round that up to 43 years. So it'll happen in the 43rd year, but it's, um, you just say it is 43 years. And that's it, I do have another question, but um, as I've run out of time, unfortunately, this will be covered in my instructions, which you can get afterwards. So how to do this last one, you, uh, you can find that out in the instructions that I've written. Terrific, thanks very much, Joanna. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and and yeah, so a reminder that everyone gets a copy of, of those files. And, um, yep and also your Word documents for the instructions. Uh, your instructions, they're very clear and, and, and easy to follow, and I think it's great. I, I use a, um, a CAS calculator myself uh, with, mm -hmm. with, with, um, with the courses I'm teaching, um, but you, you're getting so, so much out of a um, numerical solve and a non-CAS machine, that's terrific. Yeah, oh, thanks. <laughs> and Meanwhile, Bajina is uh, sharing her Hello, screen. Can you and see my screen? Uh, yes, we've. Yep, yep, we've got your calculator there. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so I will be mainly concentrating on statistics and normal distribution, as in the webinar description. But I would like to start with a question, just on number. And this question is because my class set the trial exam and had great difficulty with my top students to calculate just values like that, showing the full calculator display. And this seems to be the trend in the recent examinations. So let's see how we can tackle this question. So I will start on the new calculator document and the question had a cube root, so this is the template we need to use. And also there was a fraction inside the cube root, so I need to put my fraction there. Now the other thing this question had was powers of 10. So what we can do, we can go six, and this button here actually says six times 10 to the power four. So that was our value of M in the numerator. And then we had two other values which were 1.5, and again, if I press this button, I can put the power, and we need to multiply by this other number, which was eight times 10, so if I press it, that's what the calculator displays, at least my is set this way. Some students might even have less display depending what their float is. So what they need to do now, they need to press the arrow up and bring this number down. This is called the full calculator display. But not many students actually in studies realize that, so that's probably a good teaching strategy because otherwise they lose marks if they only display that many. Well, it's hard to say how much they require, but that is the full calculator display which is available. So that is just one of the hints which is good to know. So starting with statistics, we'll look at the chi-square question because they always get this, whether it will be paper one or paper two. So the question I selected is about the manufacturer claims that the fertilizer has an effect on the height of rice plants, and he measures the height of fertilized and unfertilized plants, and the results are given in this table. So we are having 
three rows and two columns, so degrees of freedom two, and the eight doesn't need to apply it, but all exam questions should be like that. It says a chi-square test is performed to decide if the manufacturer's claim is justified at 1% level of significance. So students should be able to write the null and alternate hypothesis. And then, of course, the thing is finding the chi-squared value on the calculator and finding the p-value depending what is required. So how do we go about doing this question? So first thing is we need to get our matrix. So as we said, we have number of rows is three, but number of columns was two. And now we need to enter the numbers. So I put 115 and 80 using tab. I'm using it on my keyboard, but of course tab is here on the calculator, 45 and 65, and tab 20, these were the numbers in the table, and 35. So what we do now, we store this matrix and give it the name. I usually teach my students to call it the observed matrix, okay? So the calculator remembers this matrix now. So now we need to perform the chi-squared test. So we go statistics, test, test, and this is our chi-squared test, and we need to enter the name of the matrix. And we are getting all the results. So the chi-squared value is 14 and the p-value is very, very small. Now students do struggle with the p-value because this p-value needs to be compared to the level of significance, which is 1%, which is 0.01. P-value here is definitely much smaller than 0.01, so we reject the null hypothesis and conclude the plant height and fertilization are not independent variables. Also, the degrees of freedom are given here, and another interesting thing is if we press the variables matrix, we variables button, we can get the expected, expected matrix. Even though students are asked to show how those numbers can be obtained, it's good for them to see that they actually get can get those values. So that's how the chi-squared <coughs> test can be performed on the calculator. And as I said, once some statistics is performed, we can also get degrees of freedom because those are the typical questions which are asked in studies exam for the chi-squared hypothesis testing. So Chi-squared critical will always be given, even though the calculator, we can find it, but the students are not expected to find the critical chi-squared value. Next question on statistics, we look at table of values given with frequencies because those ones, again, the questions where students struggle a bit with, the reason being that they forget about pressing particular buttons showing that the table is given, that particular values are given with frequencies and the calculator needs to be told that. So we want to find the mean number of penalties, we want to find the median standard deviation, draw a box plot, calculate the interquartile range. I have put the values in just to save some time. It's also important for students to know that this last value has to be actually entered. Sometimes they put eight and don't eta, enter, and those values do not match, so it is not going to work. And also very important that the columns have names. So I've <coughs> put penalties and frequency. We can't use F, it is the reserved value. And also I used a new problem to insert a new problem is document insert a new problem. And students are advised for each question to insert a new problem because then there is no problems with naming frequency twice or having the same name of the variable. So once the data is entered, we need to perform 
uh, one variable statistics. It can be done in spreadsheet or it can be done in the calculator screen. So we go menu statistics, stat calculations, and one variable statistics. We only have one list, but this list comes with frequency. So our list is penalties and our frequency list is frequency. So we press OK and all data is displayed. So the mean number of penalties is 3.02 to three significant figures. This is the standard deviation. Sigma X, not SX, that's the one the students need to use, 1.33. And then if we scroll down, we get the median, which is three, and we have Q3 and Q1. So if we want to find the interquartile range, if we enter the calculator, we can find our Q3 here, again, in the variables list, and we can find our Q1. Once we perform the test, those values will be showing. Here they are pretty simple, but sometimes they might be a bit more complicated. Now to the box plot. So again, we need to enter the statistics screen. And now here, control menu on the handheld, add X variable with summary list. The calculator, again, has to be told. If we just add penalties without frequencies, we will not obtain the, bo the correct box plot. This one always comes the other way around for some reason, so we have to swap. And first thing, the calculator draws is a histogram and plot type, and we change to a box plot. And we can see it's pretty symmetric, remembering that mean was thin, median is thin, maybe a tiny bit negatively skewed, but the box plot itself looks quite symmetric. So these are some of the conclusions students need to answer. As I said, that could also be done in the calculator screen. So because we won't be changing anything, it doesn't matter. The spreadsheet is better if we're changing something later because it automatically changes the display. So the next question is the question on regression. Again, always on every exam for studies. So this one is showing the number of passes sold in some Japanese resorts, no resorts, so depending on the how many centimeters of snow, how many passes sold, and again, we are given that in the table. So write down the mean number of ski passes sold and the standard deviation is the first question. Then we want the Pearson's correlation coefficient R. The equation is passes versus snow, so we have to find the values of M and C, gradient and y-intercept, and then use this regression line or not use it and explain why we can't use it. So again, I have entered those numbers, so we have snow in centimeters and number of passes. Now, if I want to find just the mean and standard deviation of P, so mean is quite easy because I could simply type mean and of, and my P already is remembered that, and if I press Control Enter, that gives me the mean number of passes. I can't do the same thing easily with standard deviation, so I need to perform the one variable statistics, and my variable is simply P, the number of passes, and now I can see the standard deviation is 264 to three significant figures. Now the next question was about finding the Pearson's correlation coefficient which again I might enter new calculator screen and we go to statistics again, start calculations, but we want linear regression mx plus b, and our independent variable is snow and dependent variable is p. Now, this, doing it in the calculator screen has this 
additional uh, feature which saves the regression equation. Here it saves it to F2. So we say yes, we want to do it, so we get the R0.883, two of three significant figures, and we get the values of M and B. Now, because I have saved the equation, and the question asks estimate the amount of ski passes sold in a week when the snow was 52 centimeters, so if I go F2 in 52, then I get the number of passes. There is no need for the students to actually copy those values. They can, they of course, have to copy that on the exam paper, but later those values can be easily used when they have already been calculated. Of course, using F2 in 240 doesn't make any sense. That's a huge amount of passes because 240 is actually outside the original data, snow level, so it is extrapolation and therefore the result is not valid. So these are typical questions on statistics, chi-squared regression line and one variable analysis. Now, I also have a couple more questions. I might look firstly at the normal distribution question and see how much time we have to look at the other questions. So the question here is the time adults watch television on Saturday nights is normally distributed with mean 3.4 hours and standard deviation 42 minutes. Part A, in an apartment block containing 210 adults, how many do you expect to watch less than four, four hours of television? And then part B, 60% watch at least K hours of television on Saturday <coughs> night. Find to the nearest minute the value of K. So students really need to read the question carefully because clearly the mean is given in hours and standard deviation in minutes. So if they use standard deviation 42, of course, it wouldn't make any sense whatsoever. So first thing is to change because all the questions are about hours. So we calculate standard deviation in hours as 42 divided by 60 which gives us 7 on 10 or 0 0.7 standard deviation. So we have 210 adults, and first we need to find the probability that they watch less than four hours. So going back to the calculator screen, we go menu, probability, distributions, and we do normal CDF, and we want less than four hours and 3.4 was standard deviation and 0 0.7, uh, sorry, 3.4 mean and 0 0.7 standard deviation. So this is the probability for a single adult, and because we had 210 of those, so we multiply times 210, and it would be 169 to three significant figures. The second question is a bit trickier because it's a 60 watch at least K hours. So basically, students always need to draw the, their normal distribution curve and put where this 60% or 0.6 lies. So it is the K value to the left of mean to have 0.6 to the right, but as we know, the <laughs> inverse normal has to be to the left. So we need to use point 0.4. So we go distributions inverse normal, the area point 0.4, mean 3.4, and standard deviation point 0.7. So we have 3.22 minutes, 3 hours point 0.22 minutes, but we want to the nearest minute. So we go minus 3 and multiply times. 60. So this value would be 3 hours 13 minutes. So there are just some simple tricks for the students to learn 
how to <clears throat> change to the nearest minute when we have the time given in hours as a decimal. I chose one question on the sequences and series because those are causing some problems as well. So the first question here is a series is given by this expression. Calculate the number of terms, find the sum of the series, and find the first negative term. So the students need to recognize that it is an arithmetic series, sorry, sequence series with the first term 85 and the common difference minus 7. If they're not sure, of course, they can go 78 minus 85, 71 minus, and so on. So to find the number of terms in the series, we need to use numerical solve. So we go menu, algebra, numerical solve, and we need to use the formula un is u1 plus n minus 1 times d. So un was negative 48 equals 85 plus n minus 1 times negative Seven and we solve for n. So we have 20 tens. Part B, find the sum of the series. There are two formulas in the formula booklet for studies and students find it confusing. The first one is S, n is n on 2, 2a1 two plus n minus 1d. But the second one is more useful in this case because it is just the average of the first and last, so 85 minus 48 on two times the number of terms. And that, this one is very useful as well. So it's good to show the student that there are two available because for some questions, one is easier to use than the other. So minus 48 and divide by two and multiply times 20. So this is the sum of the numbers in this arithmetic series. Now, find the first negative term. We could play with un, but I would like to show a different method. We'll just try to use the sequences feature, which is available in the press to test sequence here. So we just enter the first the general term, which is 85 plus n minus 1 times negative 7. Nothing shows because I would have to change the window, but if I press Control T, we can see that the table appears. And this table for some weaker students might be a really good way to see what happens. So if we scroll down, here we go. The first term is the 14th term when the number becomes negative. So this feature with sequences and series, the table, is quite useful because students can find a lot of interesting things by just browsing through those numbers. And sometimes we see pages of work by subtracting numbers that's not necessarily if they have the table, they can access those things much easier. Uh, so that was a calculus Joanna covered. So I might go to question on quadratics. So that causes a lot of problems as well because it's quite algebraic. So we have the parabola with general equation ax squared plus bx plus c. The vertex is at 3 and 5, and the parabola passes through point 0 and 2. Find the value of c, so they should be able to state it's 2. Then find the value of b and a. Now, we can use linear solve for that, but we can also do a different thing. So the point given is point 0 and 2 and 3 and 5. We know that x equals 3 is the axis of symmetry. So it's quite easy to get the third point from the given information. 
because it will be symmetrical to point zero to about this axis, so this point is six and two. Once that's given, I will just show because we're running a bit out of time, we can just enter those three points, zero, two, three, five, and six, two, and we can perform the quadratic regression and get minus one third two and two as the coefficient. It's a bit of like easy way of getting that, but there is no prescribed method unless they ask to form two simultaneous equations. So of course then students have to follow the instructions. So we already know that C is two, so Y is AX squared plus DX plus two, and we substitute the point to form one equation. And the other equation is the X coordinate of the vertex, which is given in the formula booklet as minus B on two A. And this is where our second equation comes from. Now, they would written minus B on 2A equals 3, but to enter into linear solve, we need to rearrange this fraction into the linear expression because the calculator doesn't like the pronumeral being in the denominator. And once we do that, the solution becomes A is minus 1 third and B equals 2. So again, depending on the question, if there is no prescribed method, we can just get three points and use the quadratic regression. If they ask to form two simultaneous equations and solve, we need to put those in a proper format so the calculator solves them. I quickly look at the coordinate geometry question. This one is giving the straight line with the equation 2x plus 5y is 10. P and Q are the axis intercepts. We want to find the coordinates of those two points, the coordinate of the midpoint joining PQ, distance OM and PM, angle POM and the area of the triangle. So I made a construction here. Of course, students are not expected to make constructions like that but they actually should draw everything on a calculator. Those numbers I've got won't be available in te <clears throat> test to test because uh, the measurement feature is not. But once they have the picture, they use numerical solve to find the coordinates of the axis intercept. So solving this equation without rearranging y equals, that's because when they rearrange, of course, they get things wrong, so we get the y-intercept 0 to the x-intercept 5. Then what I did here, I found those distances and I stored them because later I can easily find the angle using the right angle triangle here, having the values pre-written. <laughs> And once I got the angle to find the required area, I stored the angle too. So that's what I had to present today, and thank you very much, and back to you, Brian. Terrific, and thank you once again, Bajina. I knew that would be good, and it was. Um, was. Um, you, um, you, you'd never fail to deliver for us there. Uh, I have, I'm just grabbing back the, uh, the presentation here. And can I, um, just uh, while I've been working, um, working frantically on the, the, the questions there in the chat, which is great, um, can I just point out to all, all um, attendees that there is now a section in the shared activities on the TI Australia website. Uh, that's, that's well worth looking at. Um, and, and it's, it's specifically for the International Baccalaureate courses. Um, I'm sharing my screen now, so I've just gone to that, gone to that page. The activity share uh, called Senior Curriculum Inspirations, you can see is broken up state by state. Uh, and it's, what it's doing is it's, it's setting up the activities based upon which technology is permitted for each of the examining authorities. So in Victoria, we get full um, computer algebra system activities. Uh, and for the International Baccalaureate, you see that the calculator is not a CAS calculator. It just says TI Inspire CX. It does not say CAS. I'm just going to click to the Victorian one. Uh, I teach teaching the uh, so the specialist mathematics here. Notice that it says CAS 
notice that it says CAS on the calculator here. I'll just jump back there. So up in the top right, it's got those letters CAS standing for Computer Algebra System. Meanwhile, back for the IB, uh, see the there's no CAS in the top right, and this is just a, a great wealth of support for teachers here. If I go into, for example, on the SL course, and I can open up topic by topic, say the calculus, um, and here's a lovely activity on filling a vase. Uh, and if I click in on that, you see it gives me a description of the activity. And the best bit is the on the right here, download all zip files. If you click that download, what happens is you get a, uh, a zipped file of, you see there, a PDF, which is a worksheet for students, the uh, filling the vase answers PDF, <laughs> the answers for the teachers, um, and you also see there, fill the vase TNS, so that would be the, um, the corresponding calculator file that students can then copy onto their calculators and work on the activity. So that's, that's a, a wealth of resources there. Um, so thank you, Bojina, once again, expertise. Thank you to our other panellists this evening, Joanna from Sydney. Thank you. Um, and I'm expecting we might get a few teachers chasing up uh, your work there in the iBook store. <laughs> yeah, it's been going well. So details on the screen there. And now, uh, attendees, thank you also for your, qu for your questions um, and, and interest through the webinar. Now is your opportunity to type in any last minute questions. Of course, you can also use the chat facility to thank um, both our presenters for this evening. We do like uh, uh, positive feedback. You will also, when I exit the webinar event, you will be taken to a page where we ask for you to write in your feedback. The sort of thing that you can put in there also is, hey, I would like to be a webinar presenter. Please do that if you would. Um, please also, if there's topics that you would like to see a webinar on, please uh, put that in there. We're always reviewing our webinar program to try and best meet the needs of, uh, of you, the teachers. Within a couple of days, you will receive an email where and you see I'm off to Melbourne tomorrow, yeah, within a couple of days you, you, you will uh, re receive an email where you are taken to a link for your, to download your certificate for this professional development and also a link to where you can view the webinar again and share with your students, something that I like to do, and also to where you can download the, the files you've got, I think about uh, eight or so files from the calculator and also Word documents from both our presenters this evening. To share this with your students, um, you, easiest way is follow one of those links or just Google Texas Instruments Australia and pull down the professional development tab for teachers and you'll find the, the full collection of webinars on demand in the archive. Alternatively, you can access it through the Texas Instruments Australia YouTube channel. I expect you're already receiving the newsletter. If you're not, then uh, please subscribe. There is the link on your screen now. Any more questions or concerns about the products and uh, what, what is or isn't allowed on exams and how to access, for example, tutorials on the calculators, uh, the phone numbers are on your screen there. So finally, I bid you all good evening and a final thank you to all participants and to our two examiners, Bojina Graham and Joanna Kiprianu. Good night to all. Good night. Good night.